as we are living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to him, that we would give him, offer up our lives this morning. And what we're offering up this morning is our praise unto him, that we would lift his name high in this place because he is high and lifted up in this place. Amen.
Jesus paid it all, it all to him I sin had left to crimson stain. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing this again, Jesus paid and Jesus paid. today the Lord is saying that there's joy in his salvation and I just keep hearing that there's joy in your salvation this morning so wherever you have to go if you have to repent and go back to that place of joy this morning whatever you have to do to to release that this morning maybe it's a wall that you have to break through but I'm here to tell you this morning that there is joy in this place in your salvation and it goes past your circumstances It goes past your emotions, it goes past your trials, it goes past your highs, and it goes past your lows. There's joy in this place today, today. And there's joy in this place today. Praise the one who paid my day.
Jesus paid all, and all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it all. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He If you're thankful that he washed everything white as snow, give him praise in this place today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
fix our eyes on you today, Jesus. I see your face. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. I see your face. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. I see your face. You're beautiful. And you're beautiful. And you're beautiful. When we arrive at eternity, show we take this just a memory and see. Are no more will enter in as the wedding bells ring, and your ride will come together and we'll sing. When we arrive at eternity, sure, and where death is just a memory, and tears are no him in spirit and truth spirit and truth worship and praise Mehdi does something in the room his spirit is moving today we honor that this morning hallelujah Lord hallelujah as we sing this song coming up um lifting our praises up to God. Our lives, I've heard it before, I think Kimberly had said it, permeates. Permeates the smell of God. You know, like when you go by a campfire, and you could not even be close to it, but you could smell it. Or somebody barbecuing, you could smell it, and you know what it is. That's what our lives, we want our lives to be like that. When we walk by and people smell the sweet, sweet smell of Jesus in our lives. And we offer it back to him. Bless the Lord. We offer all praise back to him. The sweet, sweet smell of his goodness just saturating our lives in every, every moment. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, God. They bow before your
Let's give the Lord a praise. Yeah. You deserve the glory, Lord. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. We give you praise, yeah, we give you we glory, you we Lord. give you honor, Lord. Hallelujah. We Hallelujah. celebrate you today, God. Thank you, Lord. Scripture says in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. The second half of that scripture says, but Jesus came that he that we might have life and that we might have it more yeah, abundant. Amen. You can sit down for a minute. Sunday night at prayer, how many of you had a good time at prayer Sunday yeah. night? It's great. Thank you, three of you guys. Sunday night at prayer, the Lord began to speak to me about some things, which I thought I was going to share at the prayer, but I felt like the Lord did not want me to share it then. And I'd like for you to, if you would, to take out something that you can write on because the Lord began to speak to me and he gave me um, some years and months, some years and months. Some of the years, maybe you will be able to look at and say, yes, that was me, where the Lord maybe spoke something to you, said something to you, showed you something, or started something in your life. But you can also see that in that year, the enemy came and he sowed some seed, or he did some things, and those things that you heard from the Lord has not come to pass yet. And the enemy's even fighting you that you would even hold on to what it is that God spoke. And then some of you in these years, the enemy sowed seed into your life and you allowed it to take root. And you've been battling and you've been fighting and you have been more or less at a place now where you've just almost accepted what it is. And so it's going to be up to you to look back and you to examine and you to say, that's me. 
Because here's the years that the Lord spoke to me to speak out to you that you can examine. 2012. 2014. 2017. 2020. 2022 there's something significant about those years in some of your lives that you need to go look at and examine and see what seeds have taken root and what's taken place because the Lord also showed me 2024 in bold letters and 2024 was flashing and he began to speak to me about some months and the months were February, March, May, and July. And what the Lord said was, in these months, I am bringing jubilee. I am bringing victory. I am bringing deliverance. I am going to bring to fruition those things that I have spoken, or I'm going to deal with and break those things off of those people that the enemy has meant for their bad. Yeah. I'm going to turn situations around for their good. I'm going to set them free from whatever it is that the enemy has sown into their life. I am going to bring that wave into their life that I have promised. Some of you, God has promised freedom. God has promised you freedom in your finances. And the enemy whether it's been because of your disobedience or because of the fact that the enemy has just fought you on every hand, I want you to know that God is going to restore that as you take hold of this and you begin to be faithful and dedicated. I want you to know God's going to restore everything the enemy has tried to steal. Let it be, Lord. He's going to bring back. He's going to bring back. And this is what we, I want you to do. When, when you identify, whether it's you or what year, and then the Lord does for you what you need for it to take place in that month, I want you to come because I believe we're going to have testimonies Amen. of healing, Amen. testimonies yeah. of deliverance, testimonies of um, God's provision, testimonies of things that is way out of our control. Because I believe God is wanting to show himself strong in Bethesda. And he wants to show us that he's, he's got all this. He's got all this in the palm of his hand. The other thing God spoke to me about on Sunday night was this $50,000 that we're doing, this goal that we have, it's more than just to raise money. God began to speak to me that this is a test for Bethesda to see who really owns us, who do we really belong to, and what are we willing to step out in faith. How many of you know we are supposed to walk by faith, not by sight? I'm having trouble seeing, so you got to wave your hand around. How many of you know we walk by faith and not by sight? Well, if you don't know that, we're getting ready to start faith and discipleship class. You can come join in on Tuesday nights. We walk by faith, not by sight. So that means that I do things in faith believing even before I can see them. Amen? And so even when I give, I give by faith. I don't give by what I have in my account or in my hand. Hello? Well, Pastor Jerry, if I had it, I would give it. No, 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 that's not faith. God has spoken to us about what to give. And whether I have it in my hand or not, I should give it by faith. Believing God, trusting God, right? This is a test for us because I want to tell you something. The next thing that the elders bring before the church is going to be way bigger than this. Way bigger than this because of what God wants to do yeah. in our midst. Yeah. How many of you believe yeah. God wants to do something in our midst. The vision that we have is not meant to stay just like it is. 
God wants to see us go forward, and God wants to see us take things way beyond where they are right now. And so when you do this, ask God, believe God, trust God, and do it by faith and step out, and I believe God's going to show himself strong. Amen? Amen. Ushers would come to service this morning. We will receive the tithes and offerings. And I, I will agree with Pastor Jerry. I didn't hear the months and the days. It's far more than an event. We're looking at it like it's an event for $50,000. I walk in and we're almost at five. And we got like 12 or 13 weeks left. And I'm expecting something great to happen online. For you that are sitting there at home, obey the Lord. Obey the Lord. He owns it all. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Don't look at this like in its event. What do you want to happen in your life? If we want the windows of heaven opened up and freedom in our life and live that abundant life, obey Him. Obey Him. He is so good. Father, thank You this morning for what You're doing. Thank You for the, for the questions that's already stirring and the amounts that we are hearing, God. We're not shaking at a large amount because I know You have it all in control. God, if, if it's not in my pocket... Devise the plan in me how to do that. Give me the plan, Lord. I want to obey. It's so good to invest in other people's lives. Such a blessing to be able to invest in other, other people's lives and help them. God is so faithful and so good. God, we give you praise this morning for the testimonies that are coming of how good and how great you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Bethesda. My name is Nate, and this is Anthony. We're gonna we are gonna be giving you the announcements for today and this uh, following weeks. Start off, we have a Bethesda informational class. Uh, so that will be for if you're newer to the church and you want to learn some more about what we got going on here at Bethesda learn more about the vision and stuff like that. So if you're new uh, or just have some questions, there is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. And the date for that class will be February 18th. It's going to start at 4 p.m. Uh, next we have a, for February 24th, we have a WOW gathering. That is for the women's ministry. Uh, so women uh, come to that fellowship with uh, everyone, like-minded believers, and that's going to be from noon to 2 p.m. Next, we have a opportunity to serve at Feeding America. That will be February 26th. We usually have great turnouts, and that's a lot of fun to serve with, serve with everyone. That will be at 5.30 p.m. And the address is 300 Peterson Drive. So if you have some time, come out and serve. Uh, we, we, make it, <laughs> we make it fun. We have some friendly competition, usually going through the lines and stuff like that. So come out for an opportunity to serve. All right. And then on March 8th and 22nd, that's two Friday nights uh, with one weekend in between. 
We've got our stewardship seminar. Uh, it's free for all to attend, except for those that are taking it for credit. Um, there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby, so make sure you sign up for that. That's March 8th and 22nd. Uh, and then March 17th, we've got an opportunity to, uh, to pour into our children's ministry. They're having a lunch fundraiser. It'll be right after service across the way at the Life Center. Um, so please make plans to stay after and eat with us that day. Uh, the menu will be announced soon. Um, and then the last thing we've got is, don't forget, it was already mentioned once, but we've got our fundraiser going on. So pray about what the Lord wants you to give and, and give the way he would have for you to give. Um, and we appreciate everything we've gotten so far. Um, and let's continue to build that up. So, And let's do what we do every week. Let's meet and greet.
on back. Uh, so we open with God is good. And all the time, I know God is good. Okay, so this morning, we're going to do something a little different. And let's see, make sure my slide thing works here. Yep, we're going to do a stir up review. That's right, somebody give it. Let's give that. Ooh, ready? Okay, wait a minute, let's try it again. Hold up, hold up. This morning, we're going to do a stir up review. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, so uh, most of us, a lot of us, uh, take notes from previous uh, uh, messages that are given on Sunday, right? And so today we're going to kind of go back three or four. We're going to kind of tie them all together, and then we'll progress it on down the road, okay? So I'll give you like 10 seconds to grab your notes and go back a couple weeks, and so you can refresh yourself for the pop-up here, because... We're stirring it up, right? We're stirring up, right? The word that we've been given, right? Because sometimes, you know, as we get it, we go through the week, that word that was bouncing kind of gets a little tired. We get a little tired and it, it kind of lays down, right? So we want to stir it back up. So we'll go back a couple weeks ago. Pastor Fred was up talking, and I'll start off with this. So this was his first slide, just so you remember. This is the way a lot of us feel during the week, right? If we don't have the word stirred up, it's, hello, Jesus, I'm ready to come home. People on earth be tripping, right? I don't know about you. How many of you this week have run into a lot of people that have been tripping? You've been thinking. People to be tripping. I need to, <laughs> I need to be heading home. Okay. I need you to come back. Okay. Pick us up. So, so Pastor Fred called a couple weeks ago. Who can tell me Just one thing. Don't go through the whole sermon. We don't have six hours. Just give me one thing that you took a note on, that you remember, that stuck out, that that you grabbed hold of, that he spoke on. Huh? Reading the book of James, okay? Give me some of one more. Doug, do you need glasses? (laughs) He was doing the, the thing like that. Hebrews 11, okay? What? You show trust by, what was the word? Big long word, begins with an O, ends in obedience. Obedience, very good. Yeah, I did that for you guys. <laughs> so you trust, what, you have one? Yes, Jesus expunges our criminal record. Another one I got on there was uh, <laughs> that, um, uh, for me it was, a lot of times we take and we talk about how Jesus says king on the throne, and what he says, uh, command, says is a commandment. It's, it's a go. But that also applies, and we take that as in, well, that's what he's going to give me. But it's also in what he's telling me to do. When he says go, it's not a request, it's not an opinion, it's not a, hmm, you know, if you want to. He says go. If he says walk this way, talk this way, pray this way, then it's not a, eh, it's kind of you want to do it. It's the same king sitting on the throne, same words, it's a command, right? It's a, oh, this is what I do. Okay, and then last week, um, that was really good, good. Last week, Sean talked about our true nature and uh, intimacy, purpose, and understanding, so Give you a second, flip through your notes. Dun, 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 dun. Five, four, three, two, one. Somebody tells me something that jumped out about that. Go ahead, Chris. One more time. Correction and clarification. I'm repeating it for the people online. Yes, that's correct. That's what we're t- the word does, right? It corrects, it clarifies. Okay, anyone else? Give me something. Praise lifts God up. Worship lowers ourselves. Okay? Got me another one? Purpose is to, our purpose is to minister unto God. Okay. And so uh, give yourself a hand. You just passed the stir up review. Oh, come on. You can give yourselves a hand bigger than that. You did really good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So today, what, uh, if you go back a couple weeks, three or four weeks, I'm going to ask you what you remember from what I said. But if you go back that far, one of the things that we talked about was self-government. Because in the end, when we stand before him, the only one that gives account for my actions is, is me. I don't have to account for Chris. I don't have to account for Jimmy James and how he cheated playing the dart game. No, he didn't cheat. How they won the game and how I got upset. I, don't have to, I just have to commit for my own thing, right? That's me. That's all I'm accountable for. And we talked about how self-will and self-desire and governance is control, and self-control is where I govern my own desires. And the reason we're here, back to that one, which is interesting, is because it's all about correction and clarity. Um, and we'll get into a little more on that today. And so what we learned was, for example, in correction and clarity, is that our heart is not, when it refers to that in the Scripture, it's not this thing inside us that goes thump a thump a thump a thump when he talks about your heart, the heart of man is maybe evil, right? He's not talking about, oh, if I cut him open and look at that red thing, it's black. And even though your heart may be blackened, we use those words all the time, it is not talking about this. It's talking about the inner self. It's talking about me. It's talking about, uh, it's almost a Toby Keith song. But anyway, it's talking about me. That's what that is. Myself. It's, it's the real me. It's who I really am. That's the heart of me. Okay. And out of that comes I make choices. Because in the inner me is where I have my desires. So, that led us to this verse. And it says, for we are tempted when we are, it says drawn away in the, one of the versions. But I put it, it actually means lured. We're lured away by our own desires. Well, lure to me gives a different picture in my head. When I think of lures, I think of what? Fishing, because you fish with lures, right? I usually fish with a bobber and just a hook, but if you're good, you fish with a lure. And so, what does a lure do? What's the purpose of a lure? Yeah, to attract it. Because a fish does not want, it's not sitting there saying, I want to get caught. I want to end up in a frying pan. The fish does not say that. That bass isn't sitting there saying, I want to end up on a trophy. Right? Stuffed. He, he's not saying that. He doesn't want to do any of that. So what you have to do is take him out of what he wants and lure him to do what you want. And to do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on something he likes. So I don't throw in a big block of lead and expect him to eat it, do I? I take it, like especially if you fly fish. You take it, and you add these little feathers, and you add this little stuff, and you wrap it all around so it looks like some kind of mayfly or something like that that he, we know he desires. It's not what he desires. This is a hook. But it's what he, I know that I'm going to make my hook look like what he desires so that I can lure him and put him in my plate. So we are tempted when we are lured away by our own desires, and then when desire has become pregnant, it talks about conceived, that's what that means, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth forth death. And a lot of times we read through that, and it's a lot of bunch of words, and what it's, we're going to cut that down a little bit, and it's really a step-by-step -step process. It says you're lured by your desires, your desire becomes pregnant, it gives birth to sin, Sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Or to look like this, it's five little steps. And they're descending down. I'm Lord, step one. Before anything, before I can sin, before I sin, step one, what has to happen? I have to be Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Step two, then what has to happen? My desire has to become pregnant. It has to have that seed put in it. And then what, when we, I was talking with Gina about this yesterday, when we become pregnant, what, not me, but when women become pregnant, what happens? Yeah, before they give birth, what do they do? What is the one thing on their mind? Food. Food. Pickles, sometimes asphalt, stuff, weird stuff. They want food. Give me food, give me food, right? 
Nada was pregnant, 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd like to have some uh, pickles and ice cream. Okay, we don't, we don't have pickles and ice cream, but I want it. So I'd have to get up, right, as a good husband. Go down to the supermarket, right, because they were open 24-7 then. Get some pickles and ice cream. Okay, do you want crunchy? You know, I learned to ask that question because usually I'd get one kind, it wouldn't be the right kind, et cetera, et cetera. But, and you'd have to go back. But the thing is, we begin to eat. And it's the same way. We have a desire. Let's say I want a car. This is my example. Okay, so my desire is to have a car. Well, now it's become, it's become pregnant. So what do I do? Well, I begin to thumb through auto world. I begin to search online for the colors. I go to the web pages. What am I doing? What am I doing when I'm doing that? Searching. But I'm searching, but what am I doing? I'm feeding my desire. Yeah. I'm feeding it. It's getting bigger. It's bigger. It's growing, right? It's growing. Oh, I can, you know, I can just smell that new car smell. I go down and I go to the, the uh, uh, car place, the show place, yeah, dealership, thank you. I go there, and I, you can tell I, don't, I haven't bought a new car in a long time. I go there, and I get in, and I just sit there, you know, and I smell like, oh, mm, my pregnancy's getting bigger. Mm. Can I take it for a test drive? And I take it for a drive. I don't own it. I haven't got the payment right. But oh, my desire is doing what? It's growing. It's growing. Every time I go by, I go to bed, I'm thinking of driving that car. Right? I mean, you can apply it to any desire you have. That's what you do. And then it becomes, then I actually do it. I buy the car and I have the payment and I do all that. I'm not comparing sin, but as the example. Then I commit, and once I take the action, then now I've done it. And so out of my desire and me feeding it, now I've taken action, and sin is birthed. And the thing about sin, it never stays the same size. You don't believe that? Go tell a lie. Go tell a lie. Because you can't just tell one, because then you have to tell another. Then it'll be another, and then another. If you don't believe me, go to Veggie Tales, and there's this fib cartoon. You can watch it. It'll tell you the rest of it. They'll grow. Sin grows. It has impact. It impacts other things. Then once it grows up, that's big. And the consequence of it getting big is now we have death. It's a process. Okay. So that rings, to me brings this question. Which step of those five steps does religion usually focus on? Which one? Which step is that? Like three, four maybe? Five? Five? I got an answer, five, I got five, five, six, six, seven. Oh, I got a five in the back, got a five in the back. Got a... That's a triangle, Dale. I'm not sure what that is. Zero. Oh, zero. Okay. <laughs> so religion focuses on those. Well, what steps, when we have sermons, typically, just in broad generality, do sermons focus on? Which step? Sin. 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 You sinned. You did this. You did blank. You blah, blah. You fill in the blank. You, you, you. Don't do that. Problem is, I'm telling you, do that, and sin's unborn. He's done growing. If that's where I'm at, I'm really not helping you. It's done there. We're just working on the consequences of it, trying to keep it from moving from growing up to bringing death. Come on now, let that sink in. That's usually where we try to operate. Oops, sorry. We try to operate over in this zone. Well, you know, it's happened. That's sin. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> shouldn't have sin. Okay, I, I, I know that. Jesus died for your sin. Okay, I'm just going to cut it here, right? Okay, yeah, he died so that I don't have to experience what? Death. That I may have life. But he's not wanting me to take all these steps. Ooh. Isn't that what he says? 
Just because uh, we have grace, we shouldn't be, right? Yeah, God forbid, just because we have grace, we shouldn't be out doing a bunch of stuff just so we can come over here and experience grace. Where should our focus be? Oh, step one. Wow. Wow, I could add a V8. That's exactly right. That's where we should be focused on. What is my desire? Because if I ended up in a hole, right, there was a desire that led me to the hole. But rather than spend all my time over here trying to correct and fix and say, Oh, Jesus, I need you to keep me from, I don't know, take your pick. Get me out of jail. We'll make a big one. Oh, I need you. I've got a court date, right? Or I was speeding, Lord. Get me out of the speed tickets. You know I got no money. I can't even pay my tithes. Oh, God, help me. Come on now, right? Where's that at? We're over here somewhere. Not only has it grown up, I got caught. It's okay. We just play this field all the time. It's okay. It's okay to do what I want as long as I don't get caught. Then when I get caught, oh, Jesus, let's plead the blood to Jesus. Let's call my aunt, my uncle, my sister, my cousin, my brother. Let's call their church. Let's get them all. Come on now, right? Let's get everybody involved praying to God so that my sin doesn't bring death. Oops, sorry, went too far. So that my sin, oops, oh, jumped on me. So that my sin doesn't bring death. My sin, what I did, because I'm accountable, my desire. So what I'm telling us today is, what he, the scripture's saying is, hey, hey, wake up. It's not about, oh, I did it again. It's not about this. Yes, we even sing songs of grace, and all of that is absolutely accurate. His grace is sufficient for me. His love is abundant, and it's free. As the song says, oh, what joy fills my soul, just to know, just to know. That his grace is sufficient for me. And it is. But he wants me over here. He wants me to change me. When you're a new creature, what changes? Me. My desires. Because that's what makes me. What I want. What I'm trying to do. Okay. Okay. If we even says, uh, the last question would be, which step brings shame? Huh? Three, three, that's right. We only become ashamed after sin has been birthed. Why? Because you can see it. That's when it's evident. That's when the consequences start coming. I haven't been caught yet, but I, you know, I took that and I wasn't supposed to. But now I hear they're looking for it and they might come for me. Although I need to. Adam and Eve. They reach over. She gets the apple. She takes a bite. We'll talk about it in a minute. She hands it to him. He takes a bite. Then they, were, they saw that they were naked. So the whole first part of that is about, which I think is the next slide here. It says, and when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. So everything in the blue there, that's all in step which one? Step one. She, all of that is she saw it, she thought it was good. That's she, all that's talking about is her desire. 
That's all that's talking about. But then she begins to think on it. She saw that it was good and it's going to make me wise. It's going to be a great thing. What's happening? Oh, I'm feeding it. I go walk by. Used to, I wouldn't even say anything, but you know what? That snake, I think I'll talk to him about it. Right? I go by it day after day. Trimming, trimming, trimming. Ooh, that looks good. Okay. Finally, you know, I think I'm going to go talk to that snake. He's a nice guy. <laughs> he loves me. He's got a listening ear. What's happening? It's birthing. Until finally, oop, finally what happens? She took of its fruit and ate. And she gives it to him. And then, only then, after sin has been birthed, what happened? They saw that they were naked, and the Scripture says they were both ashamed. She wasn't ashamed talking to the snake. Should have been, maybe. She wasn't ashamed sitting there saying, you know, that's a nice piece of fruit. Juicy and golden. I think I can reach that one. Touch it. You know? I didn't die. Well, maybe, right? She only beca- what brings shame is when sin come is birth. That's where shame comes along. Okay. And so if we look at it and we say, okay, so what caused it? Well, a couple of verses up, as she's talking about it, she's talking to this snake about it. She finally got the point. She's feeding it, right? Uh, and she says, this of every tree of the garden you may freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die now i'm on a quick side here the knowledge of good and evil so this tree contained the knowledge if you eat of it you would gain the knowledge of what is good and evil there literally means adversity The problem with knowledge is, we talk about, for example, Adam knew Eve, and they conceived, and Cain was born. So when we talk about knowing, it's not just for us in the Western world, it's what's up here. Knowing is knowing and experiencing. She didn't know it, but that knowledge of good and evil meant you're going to experience adversity. Before that, she didn't experience adversity. She didn't have to choose. She just followed what God said. And it was all good. Okay, well, we talk about that. Which jumps us to, over here in the New Testament, it says, by now, we know this scripture, we from uh, every man a warrior and cultivating holy beauty. By now, you should be teachers. However, you need someone to teach you again the first principle of the words of God. And you have come to need milk, and he used this analogy of a baby. You have come to need milk and not solid food, like a baby. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, or God's word, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to the mature, that this, for this reason, that those who by reason of use of, have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. So, if we tie the previous verse to this, what she, oops, sorry, my bad. What she was after was knowledge of good and evil. Once that entered into mankind... Now we have knowledge of adversity. What God is asking us to do is, by knowing his word, we now have the ability to choose whether we want good or evil. If we know his words and we mature, Whatever has been done before us 
even back to Eve and Adam, now we have the ability, because we know the Word, to not let it have impact on our life. We can choose to do good, and the good there actually means beautiful, talking about the inner self, or we can choose to do evil, which that word actually ties back to inner rot. And what we see within ourself is inside us is inner rot. Those actions have impact. And as an example here, I've asked, Sean, if you'll come up. Sean first, by self. Okay, we, a couple weeks ago, yeah, all the way up there. We talked about how uh, we were talking about we were, uh, how the Spirit of God moves on us and takes our sin, right? And it moves as far as the east is from the west. And we had, we used these as an example, as an illustration of our sin. So, here we have Sean. And let's say, let's, let's pick a history for Sean. So, let's say his... Uh, uh, he, his, he comes from a home where uh, his uh, mom is an alcoholic and his dad is a workaholic. Okay? And we talked about how what sin is, really, wickedness, is where we take a truth and we twist it. So if that was the case, then do you think Sean would have some twisted thinking about relationship, about love. What would, what would be an example of something that might be twisted from what the Scripture says? Huh? That's right. He might be, his dad's a workaholic. He might say, well, I've got to work all this time to, that's how I get my self-identity. But God isn't saying that. I made you. You are. Your identity is in me. You have value whether you work a day or not in your life. If you follow my path. Okay, but let's say, oh, let's do a different one. Let's say, uh, let's say his dad is a, a, a minister. And an alcoholic and abuses him. And his mom is uh, has suffers domestic abuse. Could that impact? Could that twist some of the word of God in his life? That would where the devil would take that and he would take this thing and it it would begin to consume it, just wrap that around you some way. Right? Could that do it? What would that look like? Well, he might think that, well, my God is a God of punishment. Because my father figure was also, right? My father, who's also the man of God, you know. And so God, therefore, must be a God who does nothing but punish me. I can never achieve his grace. I can never achieve anything he has for me. He's always trying to find what's wrong with me and blare it out. I can never, right? Or well, let's, let's say uh, his parents are, they go to church every Sunday. Every Sunday. His mom sings in the church choir. Oh. His daddy takes up offering. But when they leave, that's the end of their relationship with God. Hmm. Do you think that could twist his understanding? Yeah. So the thing is, I don't care what scenario you play, all of us have within us things that then those twisted things we begin to act on and they wrap themselves around us and they confine us. But the problem is, like we said, sin which is falling short, and once it's birth, it doesn't 
just sit there, it grows. And so Sean's going to grow up, and he's going to find somebody to be his wife. Come on, yeah. So those are his sins, right? Those are the twisted lies that he's believed. It's a good thing that those never impact his wife. We are so thankful that we, our attitudes and behavior as men, only reside within us. They never impact our spouses. They never reach out. We never say a cross word just because we're, something may be twisted. We never do that. Just because something happens. No, no, no. What happens? This now spreads over. Whoop. Oh, what do you know? Adversity, woohoo, there it is. It expands, it loves people. Adversity loves to consume. And then what happens? Now they have a kid. It's a good thing that we never pass on any of our bad habits to our children. I am so thankful that, I have, that my kids have picked up none. None of mine, well, none of my wife's bad habits, because she didn't have any. None. I am so glad. And so, so they have a kid, and what words Caden go? There he is. Caden's going to be their kid. You guys can go. I'm going to use Caden, because you guys can be used. Okay. So the thing is, those same things interact, right? Those same lies have been passed down, and they transformed, and they're around him. And what we talked about was this. We talked about how when we submit ourselves to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how that washes that away. But I want to expand on that a little bit because in our illustration, I used water and tied it to how we water baptism, how we're mikvah and the water flows over us, right? But the difference is when I submit to him and I... I achieve, uh, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that is not water flowing over me. It is water coming out from myself, from my heart, right? From my innermost being. That water comes up and it bubbles all this trash, these false ideas that I have up. And then, oops, sorry. And then as the Spirit leads, right, what does it do? It washes them away. And even if sin is birthed, before it hits step five, all I do is cry out what? Forgive me. And the word that I have hid in my heart, my innermost being says, which is the truth, that if I just cry out, he is faithful and just to forgive me of all unrighteousness. He cuts the cycle. No longer is there death. No longer do I have to worry about the sin. He cuts the cycle. And the whole idea is, as this uh, words... Uh, you sit down now, thank you. As I have these words are placed in my heart, which is me. They are placed in me. It changes my desires. I'm going after step one. That's why he says, it's no longer, no longer will I put my word on tablets of stone. But I'm going to take the Holy Spirit, and what am I going to do? Write them on the very heart of man. Not this little thing that goes thump, thump, thump. On me, my soul, the innermost part of who makes me. So that when I make a decision, I come to that fork in the road. There's adversity there. There's beauty over here. Unlike Eve, because of who I am. 
That's right. It's who I am because he's wrote that on me. I step over into beautiful. And he leads me down this path. And you say, well, troubles come. Absolutely. Because part of his word that I've written in my heart is, in this world, you will have trouble. That's part of what he wrote. It's in my heart. It's right there. But that's not all of it. It says, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. So even though there's adversity, even though things come, and he even says this, I will bring stuff in to test you to confirm your strength so that you know where you are with me. He even says, those that I chastise, I do it because why? <gasps> I've written that on my heart. That's part of what, who I am. That's part of the, the, the flow of the, the Spirit. Because in my inner heart, who I really am, now he's changing it. Now when I step forward, oh, look, this, I, I go out of town for business. So when I go out of town and I'm by myself, I don't go over to Honky Tonkville. Why? Because I have no desire. It's not because my wife's there, church there. I go out to California sometimes. There's nobody there that knows me. But I don't have a desire to go out and go there. Why? Because it's here. He's written it on my heart. Jesus said, and I'm going to bring it to this, if you guys can come. We'll tie this scripture in. Jesus said as he starts his ministry, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. And He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So He says, there's two points I want to make here. One, He says, now we'll go to the brokenhearted. We'll skip that. He says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Typically, when we read that, what are we thinking? Those that mourn. My girlfriend left me, and Jesus is there to help me. He's going to heal that. I didn't get that job, and Jesus is there to heal that. I stubbed my toe today, <laughs> Right? And Jesus is there to heal that. He is there to heal that, right? But that's what we're thinking. That's not brokenhearted. What's the heart there? Me. I mean, I don't know if you catch it, but that to me is one of those. I read that, I was like, drop the mic. Do you get that? His ministry was to heal the inner self, me, the brokenhearted. Now it all makes sense. I mean, it, it ties everything together. That's what he's doing. He is healing the brokenhearted. That's why he set up the church. That's why it's all around learning the word. Because as I put the word in my heart, right, what does it do? It, I wash, I'm washed by the water of the word. It brings those things up. It floods those things out. It gushes from inside. I no longer have to wait on something to happen on a Sunday. But every day as I'm walking my life, I'm communicating with the Holy Spirit and what he, does he do? He just bubbles it up. And he says, you know what? That's an untruth that you're believing, that you were taught. Let me straighten that for you. And when he straightens that, what happens to that heart that was broken? It's healed. That's what he's after. That's the name of the game. He is here to heal your broken heart. Not your feelings. He is here to heal you. All those lies that you were taught growing up or that you've been told or whatever has happened, 
He's saying, hey, hey, hey. It's not it. You're broken. You believe in a lie. That's twisted. They took what I said and they twisted it. Even on Eve, right? That's how she started her path. It was, well, he said, the, the word of God said, God has spoken, which is his word, said if we're not supposed to touch the tree. Well, what is that? That's a twisted word. It's not what he said. She had within her an untruth. And what did it do? Caused her to follow the steps and out of sin came death. That's what happens. He wants to, as they get ready to play today, and, and a lot of times we'll talk and we'll say, well, if you don't know Jesus, well, here's the deal. If you know Jesus or don't know Jesus, the truth is there is something that you've learned and you've accepted that's not truth. It's twisted. And we're going to take five minutes or so or ten or whatever he's got and just take time for the Holy Spirit to bubble that up, wash that away. And when he brings it up, what's your part? Oh, forgive me. Then he does the rest. Well, I, you say, what's that look like? Well, let's look like, well, I, uh, I treated my kids, he brings to mind, the way you treated your kids in that situation, wasn't right. Wasn't right. Well, I, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, your way or my way? You're right. Wasn't right. That's what that looks like. When you were over here and somebody upset you and rather than go to them, you went around. With that unruly member, which is our what? Tongue. Tongue. He's going to bubble that up. That wasn't right. That wasn't right. But they, you don't know God. You don't know. I mean, that's how we make our excuses. You don't know. Yes, you're omniscient and you're great and wonderful, but you don't know. You know everything, but you don't know this. No. He's going to bubble that up. This is your only response. Forgive me. And it floats. As far as the east is from the west, into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up again. If we'll all stand, the altar is open.
Sean talked, uh, I'm going to bring it to a close here. Sean talked last time about our true nature. And so if I was asked the question, and it was so, uh, what is, if, if I asked you to describe, what is the nature of man? What would your answer be? Typically, when I ask that question, people say, well, it's evil, it's da 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 but if we go back to the very beginning, it says that we were made in the image of God. So my true nature is to be like Him. You see, sometimes we view it as, this is my true nature and it takes going to take everything I got to get over here. And I just hope I can make it to the side of the Spirit. But that's the wrong example. This is where you belong. This is your true nature. You just got to start casting off weights. As you mature, it talked about, I smell the inner rot. Well, you got to find that which is rotten inside and set it off. So that you can live in your true nature. Sure, yes. Amen. You may not be catching that, but it's a big difference. Over here, 
I'm not even sure I got hope to make it. I hear you tell me, he says, my hope. But wait a minute. If this is my true nature, this gets a lot easier. I was made in the image of God. Whoa. You both, that, that doesn't look like God. That doesn't belong there. Those words I said to that person, God wouldn't do that. I was made in the image of God. Then he bubbles up something else. Oh, that doesn't, that's not what that is. That's not who I am. I am made in his image. That's your picture. That's what we should be going by. And today, I thought it was funny, but we actually talked about this in our devotion because it leads to this question that you have to search out this week as you go. What is my heart cry? What is it that's inside of me? That's, what is it really screaming for? Does it want the things of this world? I tell you, when hard times come, you know what your heart cry always turns to? Him, help me. Help me. Help me. Why? Because that's my nature. My natural response is to cry out to the source that made me. I belong here. I don't think you caught that. I don't belong over here. This was not made for me. I was never to be here. Here is where I belong. But I couldn't make it on my own. So he sent his son to show me the way. Hey, hey, why are you living in that rotten mess? You're one of his own. This is where you belong. Have a blessed week.